As for the unschooling part, it really happened by accident. Once we decided that we were going to be doing this indefinitely, she did her research and she found something called unschooling and we were already doing it. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Learning by Living, the podcast about people who learn outside of conventional schools. On today's show, we have a mother-son team, Lainey Liberti and Miro Siegel, who haven't had a permanent home address for 11 years. In 2008, Lainey, a recovering branding expert, and her son Moreau set out for a life-changing journey together in travel. After closing their business and selling and giving away all of their possessions, the two hit the road for what was supposed to be a one-year adventure. 11 years and almost 50 countries later, the two continue to travel slowly around the globe, living an inspired, possession-free lifestyle, volunteering, and learning not from school, but from the world around them. In 2011, they co-founded Project World School in hopes of bringing this experience of learning through travel to others. Today, we talk about that project as well as how the two learn without school through life in the truest sense, learning by living. We hope you enjoy this fantastic episode. Hi, Lainey. Hi, Miro. Hi, Tina. Hi, Kevin. Hi, guys. How are you you doing? So excited you're here. So, so excited. (laughs) Um, so we always ask guests to introduce themselves. So I'd love you both to introduce yourself. Okay, so I'm Lainey, and um, I'm Miro's mom. He'll introduce himself next. But in brief, we are unschooling travelers, and we call it world schooling. We've been homeless or location independent for 11 years. We've probably traveled to, gosh, I don't know how many, 40 countries over the last 11 years and we travel we travel deep not wide um we like to dig our heels into a culture and explore the culture through both the history art science um geography politics all of that stuff and you can only do that by going deep We have spent a good portion of the last 11 years in Latin America, three years in Peru, and, you know, all of the Central American countries. Um, We've traveled briefly through Europe, through Asia. Um, We've even dipped our big toe into South Africa. We've done a lot. We're really interested in exploring the culture and learning through the world. And um, this is how I raised Miro, who was 10 years old when we first set out, who's now turning 21 in less than a month. Yeah, that's me. I'm Miro. (laughs) I'm Lainey's son. And uh, like she said, I've been basically raised this way. So I've spent over half my life on the road, traveling, uh, world schooling, learning intentionally um, through the experiences that we have out in the world. And uh, yeah, we're advocates for it. We think it's an amazing, amazing way to raise your kids. It's an amazing experience you can give to them. And, uh, you know, we're speaking from, we're speaking from experience and we're speaking from the heart. So we should also mention that out of all the places that you've been, we're actually talking to you while you're in California, which (laughs) is, I will confess something of a disappointment because Peru, (laughs) South Africa, and you know, not that there's anything bad about California, but it's so tame. Well, when Gina invited us to be on your podcast, we were actually in Vietnam. And I said, let's wait. We've got a short window when we are in California and we can guarantee that there's going to be a better internet connection. So I would say out of all of the challenges that we've had on the road, connectivity is probably among the top. (laughs) So I love your background story and I want to have listeners hear it. So what got you involved in traveling and unschooling and doing all that you do? Well, before we left on our trip, uh, we lived in LA and my mom ran a niche branding agency, which was pretty successful when, you know, the economy was good. But in 2008, when everything tanked, um, her agency was the first to go because she served green and eco uh, like nonprofit clients for the most part. And so their funding went and subsequently she went and so did her employees. And um, we realized that we wouldn't be bringing them back. And more than that, we realized that we were both unhappy with the way that things were. Um, I was going to, to a public school. Uh, I was pretty miserable. Um, she was working upwards of 80 hours a week and she was also pretty miserable. Um, and we took that abrupt change as a catalyst. We took it as a sign. 
And we basically made a decision to go out and have an adventure together and to experience the world. Um, back then, we didn't know that we would be uh, doing it 11 years later. Um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we, nevertheless, we set out. And um, we were gone for about eight months before we decided that this was going to be, um, you know, a, a perpetual life choice. So we're still going. And as for the unschooling part, that's actually pretty interesting because it really happened by accident. We, we had no idea what unschooling was. Um, and what's funny is we were doing unschooling without even knowing that there was a term for it. So in that first year after we'd left, there was no question that I would be learning more than I would be if I had just stayed in fifth grade. Yes. But once we decided that we were going to be doing this indefinitely, then you know, my mom has to be the responsible parent. She's got to do all the research and, and figure out exactly how her son is going to be educated. And uh, she did her research and she found something called unschooling and we were already doing it. <laughs> we just decided to keep doing it. And then as we, we continue to travel and as we continue to uh, integrate our travel with our education more and more, um, we decided to kind of call it something else. We decided to call it world schooling rather than just unschooling um, because we wanted to make it more of an active process. Yeah. And I would just say from the parents' perspective, you know, we set out as parents to do the best that we can for our children and being a single parent and owning a business in Los Angeles and building a future. I did all of the things that was expected of me from a societal perspective. I was, you know, putting money away. I was successful. Um, but what I was not doing was spending time with my child. And in fact, I was missing out on his entire childhood. And that was very heartbreaking. And realizing it and feeling the, the pain, I was missing out on something that was so precious to me was something that I I had a hard time reconciling with. And when the economy crashed, as Miro said, it was more or less a catalyst to make a change. It was almost as if the world gave us permission. Once we started to travel, we noticed that there were so many changes happening, not only in who we were as human beings, but who we were as partners, who we were as people in the world, and who we were as learners. Suddenly, learning became a huge part of what our daily routine was, you know, we were learning without effort. We were interested. We were engaged. We were engaged in our lives. We were present. All of these things that I intellectually hoped for, but didn't have the time to actually be present and do. After eight months of traveling, Miro looked at me and said, can we just continue doing this? I didn't want to go. I don't want to go back. So where did you go that first year? And what were your expectations of that year? Like, was it just going to be a reset year or did you just set out to do something with that year? Um, I guess you could say it was, it was expected to be a bit of a reset. Um, we weren't entirely sure what we were going to do after that year. Maybe we would go back to California. Maybe there was even talk of possibly resettling in Argentina. Um, cause our, our plan for that first year was to travel South and just keep traveling for a year until we hit Argentina. And we were woefully unprepared when we made that, uh, that goal because 11 years have gone by and we still haven't made it to Argentina. Um, <laughs> But, you know, in that, in that eight months, those first eight months, we only made it as far as, as Guatemala. We went down through Mexico, wow. visited Belize, and then we wound up in Guatemala. Lainey, earlier you said something interesting. You used the phrase learning without effort. And I was actually going to ask Moreau, you know, you, you went to a public school for, I think you said until fifth grade. Is that right? I went to a Montessori school for a little bit, and then I went to public school. So uh, up until so, fourth grade. So if you had to explain to people the difference between what learning feels like in school and what learning felt like after you'd started going on your, your adventure, can you kind of sum up what the difference is there? Well, I would say it's the difference between an active and a passive process. Um, and then there's also a matter of, of resistance as well. Um, and I think that's mainly what my mom is talking about when she says effortless. So in school, 
um, I feel like the learning process is a passive one. You are being molded by a teacher, by an instructor, um, and they're the ones who hold the information. And you're the one who must learn the information. And it's a very cut and dry process. Um, so I would say in that situation, the learner is put in a passive situation. Whereas when you're traveling, you are basically the one who takes ownership over the experience that you're having. And that makes it more relevant. It makes it um, more contextual and it adds a whole lot of meaning to learning experiences for the learner, for both myself, for both my mom. Um, we've definitely picked up things that, you know, I don't think you'd be able to pick up in a, a school setting, a classroom setting. Um, and the way that we remember those things and the way that those things feel to us, it's much more personal and much more, um, yeah, just meaningful. And experiential learning is driven through intrinsic motivation. That's right. Um, nobody told us to go to a particular site or ask particular questions. It was because we were motivated and engaged and also because we were learning in partnership. We were learning together and it really was humbling for me to discover that lifelong learning is a gift that I was allowed to engage in. Um, you know, of course, before the belief system that I held was learning happened while you were young. It happened in this very contrived environment. And it happened only uh, up until I, you know, became a certain age. Um, that shifted for us because we were experiencing something totally different. We were experiencing experiential learning, multi-age learning, and learning because we wanted to learn. And for example, the first couple months, I realized that I had this really deep desire to go deeper with ancient history. With pre-Columbian history, that was the first exposure that I had. So we were going to um, archaeological sites. We were going to museums. I was reading books. Suddenly, I was engaged in origin stories. And this opened up a whole new world of learning for me because I was there and it was meaningful and because we were having this really deep learning experience together. And I, had, I never had interest in history in any other form throughout my life. I was 40 and then I discovered that I like history. That to me was mind blowing. It sounds amazing and it sounds wonderful. Were there scary parts to the journey? And how did you sort of get over any fearful experiences? The whole journey was scary. <laughs> I mean, that, that whole first year, like I said before, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. You know, we stepped off the plane in Mexico and I remember there was this wave of, oh, wow, we're really here. We actually did it. What have we done? <laughs> Neither of us spoke a single word of Spanish. Um, my mom had traveled maybe 20 years before when she was much younger in Europe. Um, I had never really traveled. And it was just, it was really overwhelming. And it, I think it kind of, that feeling persisted. It persisted for those, that first year. Um, and it, slowly dissipated as time went on through exposure, through experience, you know, we realized, okay, things aren't necessarily as scary as we're making them out to be. And it really just took time and experience to make that go away. And he's being really kind. I mean, the first month I was like in tears. I was, yeah. you know, every night, thinking to myself, oh my God, what did I just do? What have we done? Where are we? And I remember the feeling of the hot, humid air hitting our faces as soon as we got off the airplane. And I remember our backpacks being too heavy and we're feeling weighted down and everything's different and colorful and the smells were different. And I just felt so disoriented. It just felt so out of my element. And that was overwhelming. And, you know, it took a couple of really big exhales that, you know, took more than three or four months, you know, to complete. Exhale, exhale, exhale. And every now and then throughout the first year, those fears cropped up. And I had nights where I cried and still questioned what my decisions were. But you know what? 
stepping outside of your comfort zone is not always the the most graceful thing, but it's it's a space where you discover who you are and it, and you can discover what you're capable of. That's so cool. That's so inspiring. So in terms of the learning aspect of this, um, one of the questions I, I like to ask guests, so I hope learn, listeners don't find this redundant, what are some things that you've learned on your journey that a skeptic would be surprised by? Maybe the skeptic would think, oh, well, that's something you surely learn in school, but you would never pick that up without school. Well, uh, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is language learning. Um, I picked up Spanish you know, without spending really much effort at all. Um, over the course of a few years, I basically picked up Spanish by accident. Um, I just kept practicing with people. I kept um, listening. I was surrounded by it. It was on menus. It was on, you know, newspapers, whatever. I was, I was in it. And uh, I ended up picking it up fluently. And I can speak Spanish now. And I've never once taken a class. You know, I could go on about all of the, the hard skills that you learn, you know, when I say that with quote, quotation marks, um, you know, you learn about geopolitics, you learn about economics, you learn about history, about science, about, you know, whatever it is, just through exposure to different sites, to different, you know, events. Um, but I really think the most important thing that you pick up through travel, it's not any of those things, because those things can be learned. That's, that's just it. Those things can be learned pretty much in any context. But I will say the soft skills, and I hate that term, but the soft skills that you learn through travel are the most important aspect of it. You learn patience. You learn how to be compassionate with other people. You learn how to, you know, put yourself into a different perspective and try and look at things differently. You learn how to confront biases. You learn how to do all of these amazing things that have less to do with facts and, and you know, dates and what have you, and more to do with how to efficiently navigate the human condition. And I think that that's something that, you know, travel is unparalleled in. And not only do you learn those things, you practice those things. So cooperation, collaboration, um, you know, many of these skills are absolutely required in order to travel. And I would say Miro touched on one thing, which I think is vital, especially to Americans, is you learn that your worldview is not the only worldview. And in fact, you become compassionate, you start creating space for other worldviews to live side by side and through that awareness that your worldview is not the only way to see the world your worldviews do indeed expand and i know that moreau wanted to move on from the hard skills and i'm completely sympathetic to why and your points about that i do want to go back there for a second if you don't mind because i know a lot of folks who are skeptical of learning without schooling for some reason, science and history, in my experience, is kind of one of the, the two of the big sticking points. Math is pretty easy to convince people that you, you'll kind of pick up math along the way. Uh, language, yeah, probably that too. But science and history. I wonder if you have any um, stories or examples of here's ways I've learned things about science and history that where I didn't really intend to sit down and learn them, but I, I was moved to. Well, history to me is a, a bit of a no-brainer. Um, I think that's one of the easy ones to convince alongside math and language learning. Um, if, if you travel and you have your eyes open and you visit different sites and you talk to people about you know, the events that transpired, I mean, you're learning history from an anthropologic perspective. Um, it's, it's much less one-dimensional maybe. It, you're not reading the history from you know, an approved source but you're almost learning uh, the people's history. Uh, and I think that that really uh, adds a lot of dimensions to it. But if you're visiting archeological sites, if you're visiting museums, if you're visiting you know, cultural sites, the history is all around you when you travel. And it's, in my opinion, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to not notice all the history that's there. But maybe that's just me looking for the history because I love it. Um, I don't know. I, I Gina, is that, is that your impression too? Is that, do you notice that history and science are the two big sticking points that you find with people? That's just what I find. Yeah, I mean, I think history, 
history is there. I think science is hard, um, but I'm sure, Miro, you can give us examples of how you've learned science on the road. Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, it, it just comes down to what I said before about the learning experience being passive and being active. It really doesn't matter what the subject is. So long as you're active and you take ownership over the learning process and journey, um, you can make anything happen on the road. There's, if, if you are interested in science and you have uh, maybe a learner who is interested in science, then you can definitely make that happen by going to museums, by you know, visiting homesteads. If you want to talk about biology, if you want to go and you, know, you can go and visit labs in a lot of countries and have tours of, of those kinds of facilities. Um, the, it, I would say it really is possible. It, through experience, you're able to go and you know, make these things happen. I think one of the main keys, uh, especially for science though, is it's a little bit less accessible if you don't know how to ask for the experience that you're trying to have. I'd love to share some examples of some scientific learning. And I would also say as an unschooler, we don't divide subjects, but there are aspects of science in everyday life. Yeah, that's, that's a crucial point. I find that a lot of people miss. Absolutely. Well, here's an example. Um, in Cusco, in Peru, um, we every year visit the... Um, the uh, what is it called the the planetarium sorry it's a beautiful planetarium up on the top of the hill of Cusco above Cusco and not only are we exploring the stars and we're learning about how the ancients saw the night uh, skies we're looking through the the telescopes and so forth which gives us exposure to a totally different night sky. We're learning how the interpretation through the ancient people that lived there created myth and how that actually flows into their planting season and when they harvest. And everything has to do with the, the synchronicity of the seasons, the sky, um, and that flows into history. So it's a perfect example of how science is utilizing or, or how myth is utilizing science and everything is very connected. Um, we've also visited, uh, uh, what was, Nero, what was the um, museum in Lima that we visited where we saw the snakes and we learned about the movement of diseases through... Um, it was a research center. It was a, yeah, it was a research... It was a research center turned museum uh, on toxicology. There you go. <laughs> so, but this was relevant to us because we were going into the Amazon jungle and the... Department of Health had this exhibition, and because we were foreigners, they we asked if we could go back and actually see the specimens. So they brought out the snakes for us, and they were wearing the full body gear, and they had the snakes on the stick, and they were in a, a, a very you know protected room. And we learned by seeing, by interacting, by asking questions, and by understanding the 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 relevance of the science and the 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 research that they, that they were doing to track not only um, poisonous snakes, but how the mosquitoes were carrying specific diseases and so forth. It was all connected into our experience that we were about to have as we were venturing into the Amazon jungle. You guys really defined the movement. You are the original world schoolers. You are people that really defined and created this movement. And then it became Project World School. Is that how it worked? Well, I mean, as with everything, there's a little bit of backstory behind Project World School. Um, and, you know, it actually came from a very personal place. Uh, we had been traveling at this point for maybe four years full time. And I just turned 14. And I was really starting to, to feel isolated. I was starting to hit a wall. You know, the first four years had been amazing, but now I was really seeking some kind of community. I wanted to be surrounded by my peers. And it was difficult because I'd met people on the road. I'd met travelers and I'd also met locals that were my age, but neither one of those parties really ever understood my perspective totally because I really wasn't quite either of those things. 
And so I went through a really, really difficult period of my life where I felt very under the weather. I felt depressed, felt very isolated. And we were trying to come up with a solution. And we, we juggled a couple of ideas. We, we said maybe, you know, we would go back to the U.S. and she would pick up a conventional job again. And I would, uh, I didn't really want to go to school. So, I mean, that was not something that I was really interested in. But, you know, maybe we join a co-op or something or, or we just keep traveling and then try and get through it. Um, and it was just really difficult because we quickly realized that the community that I was seeking didn't really exist anywhere. Even if we had gone back and resumed a, you know, a somewhat normal life in the U.S., I don't think that I would have found that community. Yeah. Um, and so we decided on a third option. We said, let's make that community and let's bring it to us. Yeah. We had this idea also that surely if I feel this way, there's no way I, I can be the only one who's kind of stuck in this, this funk. There have to be other young adults that are, are kind of feeling a similar thing. And so we provided that opportunity for myself and for other young teens. And now, obviously, as I've gotten older and more self-actualized, for me, it's much less self-serving now. And I, I run the trip still almost out of service for, um, for people who might have been in my position. Right. So that's, that's truly where Project World School began um, with the teen retreats. And we've been running uh, summits as well. And that's kind of more your speed. So... Maybe you want to talk about that. So the Project World School Family Summits are conference gatherings for families. And they're five days of um, sessions and, and presentations sourced from within our community. So the thought about world schooling is there are no experts in world schooling. We all travel differently. We all educate differently. Some people are still focused on conventional education, while others are, you know, nomadic, radical unschooling families. I mean, we've got the spectrum. Um, but it's important for us to all come together, you know, once, twice a year and understand that we're not alone and that we are community and the other purpose for that is to normalize the lifestyle for the children. Children can feel that they are, you know, ripped away from their home setting and their friends and their neighborhoods. And that could feel isolating to them in the same way that Miro had those feelings of isolation. We do them twice a year. Um, once in the spring, we meet in Mexico, and then in the fall, we alternate each year between Europe and Asia. And it's been an amazing, you know, seven years of running Project World School. So cool. I love that. So what I want to ask is, if an individual is interested in Project World School, how does it work? Like, what do they have to do? And what should they prepare for? And then what does it feel like to be in that country with you and Miro, um, sometimes alone for the first time? Um, well, I think all that you would need to get involved is an open attitude and an open mindset. Um, if you're interested and willing to partake in different cultural, you know, excursions, all that kind of stuff, then you're, that's pretty much all you need. Um, we, we basically accept people who want to have an active role uh, in the trip that they're about to take. Um, we tend to turn people away who you know, are forced into it by their parents or who actively don't want to be there and they're kind of resisting because I feel like it kind of goes against our philosophy of you know, self-directed learning. If you don't want to be there, don't be there. Yeah, uh, that's really the main thing um, in terms of like a, a prerequisite for joining us in, on a Project World School trip. The way that the structure is set up for Project World School trips is non-hierarchical. So there is no one entity on the trip that has this authoritative power over all of the others, whether it's us, the facilitators, or the teens. And like you said, a lot of these these young adults, it's their first time. Uh, traveling <clears throat> on their own. Uh, for a lot of them, it's their first time out of the country and it's with us. And for a lot of these young adults, it's their very first time being put in a position like that where imagine. they're expected uh, the, the best, really the best is expected from them. 
and they're no different. They're seen as no different than the adults on the trip. And that's huge. I think that's the most intriguing thing about these trips and also such a great lesson to have in your teens that you are indeed responsible for yourselves. Definitely. And it's, it's an environment, a safe environment that they can experience that in. And it's the first time many of these teens have been responsible for functioning in community. Mm-hmm. And this is the moment that they get to decide how they fit not only into the world, but into the immediate community. And so whoever people thought they were back home, they get to recreate who they want to be. If somebody's pinpointed somebody and said, you're always lazy, you're lazy, you're lazy, you're lazy. Well, guess what? You become lazy. But now they get to step into the role of creating the person that they want to be in a fresh environment and they're totally accountable and totally responsible at all of those those other ideas that they may have thought about themselves get to drop by the wayside and they get to be the person that they want to be in a fresh environment and create that. Can we talk about um, the game you're inventing or Ooh. have invented? So I'm, I'm creating a, a tabletop game with a friend of mine who I actually met on one of the Project World School retreats um, last year, or two years ago now at this point. And it's, it's a tabletop pen and paper game. Um, it's, it's very complex. Um, there's a lot of numbers and dice rolling and there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, but it's all based on ancient Greece. Um, and it's thematically accurate. So it's historically and mythologically um, accurate. At least that's what I've attempted to do. Cool. And the idea for this was I wanted to, you know, obviously create something that people can have fun with, but also something that can introduce people to that ancient world and uh, do it in a truthful way so that they can walk away from the session feeling like they've learned something, truly. In terms of what comes next, what does come next? for both Lainey and Miro. Well, right now we're getting ready to wrap up our production for a virtual world schooling summit that we have produced with over 50 speakers. We have a an in-person summit coming up in Mexico. And then as of last year, one of the new projects that Miro and I implemented was offering an intro world schooling trip for teens that have not yet stepped out and are not quite ready for a one-month trip. You get the exposure of living in community, um, building community, learning from the world, and having these external experiences with a group of, of peers. And that's really, really really wonderful way to test the waters, if you will. Yeah, we got a lot going on. Plus, um, in October, we will have our um, second Project World School Family Summit in Vietnam, in Hoi An. We just spent a month in Hoi An, Vietnam, and fell in love with the area. It's incredible. The skeptic, I'm sure, will say, and we'll be listening to this saying, oh my goodness, I could never imagine doing anything like this. I have responsibilities where I am. I have bills to pay here, et cetera. But it occurs to me when listening to your story that before you took off on your journey, you too probably would have thought this is not something that's on my radar. This is not something I can do. What would you say to the skeptic? What, what do you know now about doing this and about how this works that you didn't know before? All I have to say on that is we had bills until we didn't. Yeah. You know, we, we, had, we had responsibilities until we didn't. There are always, there's always a way to get out of things if you want to. There's always a way to you know, pave the way for the life that you want to lead. And something that we've learned after being on the road is it's really not that inaccessible as people think it is. Um, it's travel is really not that expensive. It's something that is convenient for us because we don't make a whole lot of money. So it's, it, we're able to do it. It's not that expensive. We would be spending more trying to resume and live a conventional life in the U S um, than we do on a, a month by month basis when we're traveling the world. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't really totally realize. 
And I would also say that we are responsible and we do have different bills and we do have different responsibilities. Um, but we, we, we're not running around the world irresponsible or, or, you know, not paying our bills. It's just a different set of responsibilities and a different set of, of bills. If, if that's what's concerning you, um, we did pay off our credit cards and any debts that we had before we left on this trip. So we did leave debt free and that's different for a lot of people. I'm sure um, it was difficult to do, but it was one of my absolute goals before we left and that was achieved. And when we left, we sold almost all of our possessions and living possession free and living um, without the burden of like car insurance or gas bill or those things has created a freedom for us that I would not trade in for the world now. It's the conventional lifestyle to me feels very, very heavy. And we really like having the freedom that we have. I'm sure there's going to be people listening to the podcast for a variety of reasons, you know, um, maybe won't be able to or aren't attracted to world schooling. We even hope that people from within like conventional educational environments are listening to this podcast. What would you say to them in terms of what you've learned from your journey that, that you can, that would be of use to those people? So maybe people who are in conventional schools and are kind of thinking about, you know, learning and how it works and things like that. What would you say? to those folks? Well, I would first um, define world schooling. World schooling is not one way of doing things. We are one end of the spectrum. We're probably the most radical and extreme. Um, but world schooling basically means using the world around you as a classroom. So if you are in a conventional school um, you can world school, you can take trips, you can take family vacations, and it's about the intentionality of learning. It's not vacationing. It's about going to a place and understanding that there are um, things to learn. It's about engaging. It's about utilizing the world around you as this amazing playground of learning. And it's about doing multi-age learning. It's about learning in partnership. It's about creating the kind of experiences that you want to create. So living a conventional life is still possible. On the other hand, if you are looking to take a gap year, that still could be considered world schooling. You can invite people from other countries into your home to spend an extended period of time and have this cultural exchange. And guess what? That's world schooling too. There are many, many, many ways of world schooling. I would also say to someone who's coming from a more conventional schooling setting, um, be patient with the de-schooling process. If you do decide to pursue a different kind of educational path, whether it be, you know, unschooling, homeschooling, or even world schooling, um, you have to be patient with de-schooling. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with what de-schooling is, is it's the, it's the idea that you, let's say you have a kid in a traditional schooling setting where, you know, they're basically, they're told what to do, what to learn, how to learn it, and when to learn it. Um, and they really don't have a whole lot of autonomy. They, they can't, they don't even have the autonomy to go to the bathroom without asking for permission. Now you take a, a kid from this setting and suddenly you give them the autonomy that they've not had for the last, you know, period of time. And then what are they going to do? Um, you know, their decisions might not be something that you as a parent or guardian approve of. Because, you know, they're going to they're gonna make irrational decisions because it's the first time they can make those decisions. And, and so that's a really important aspect that um, I think a lot of people neglect to talk about, how it takes a lot of time to get over the behaviors that one picks up in school. And really, the only thing you can do is to be patient. So is there any last thing or last message you want to share with listeners? I would say my my biggest piece of 
advice to anybody who's considering stepping outside of the conventional choice for education? And even if you are not interested in world schooling, the best piece of advice that I can give to anybody is try and find a place where you can be comfortable being uncomfortable. (laughs) And what that means is once you step outside of your comfort zone into an area that we like to call the stretch zone, remember, it's not comfortable there. And that's where the magic and growth happens. So if you're challenging yourself, start feeling that being uncomfortable is an okay place to be. We don't always have to have conveniences around us, and we don't always have to be comfortable in everything that we're doing. There's magic there, and that's where where the growth happens. I love that. And Miro? My main point is be patient and communicate. And really listen to what your child has to say, because... You know, chances are there's always going to be some truth to their perspective. Um, I, I respect the, uh, you know, there's, there's always the parenting thought of, well, I know what's best for my kids. And, you know, you, you probably do. Yeah, I, think it's, I think it's really important. Um, and if anything, just to encourage your kid to have a voice and encourage your kid to speak up. And, you know, I think a lot of problems happen um, as a result of not being able to find your voice and that starts earlier than you might think.